Hello everybody, welcome to the next episode of Cross Border Talks. My name is Veronika Sošová Salminen and today we have, I think, very interesting and very actual topic. We are going to speak about neoliberalism and about neoliberal resilience. Uh, for many, neoliberalism became a kind of buzzword without real meaning. It is often repeated in the media. However, I think it is a very important uh, term which uh, we should uh, be able to understand. It uh, it has particular meaning. We can see it as not just as ideology, we can see it as a particular political economic regime, as a gover- uh, governance system or systems of governing. And in the in, in the in the center of neoliberalism is most probably we can say it is the belief in the free market and in economic forces as a key organization principle for the societies, if you put it in a, in a nutshell. Today we are going to speak with our special guest, Chilean scholar political scientist Aldo Madariaga, who is joining us today from Chile directly, and who wrote a very interesting book about neoliberal resilience. This book is interested not only that because it is mapping why neoliberalism is still so actual and so important for shaping our lives and uh, our societies and our politics, but he also did something what not many do, in my opinion. He was trying to compare two uh, not so often compared regions, and that is Latin America and Eastern Europe. His book, uh, Neoliberal Resilience, uh, is go- which we will introduce in a while, is actually comparing four different examples from these two regions. He's comparing uh, Chile, and Argentina from the Latin American part and uh, Poland and Estonia from the Eastern European part. So we will today have a look at this at this topic uh, and I am glad that I can welcome my today's co-host also with us, Malgorza Taklubachevska Figa, who is here with us. And Aldo, hello to Chile. Hi, Veronica. Hi, Malgorza. Uh, and I would uh, start with the first question, which as usually is the question uh, more generally asked. We are speaking about the uh, neoliberal resilience. So I would like to ask you what is meant by this term and uh, what, why it is an important topic to be actually actually studied and, uh, and uh, why it helps to explain the dynamic of uh, neoliberalism in different uh, contexts of your study. Yeah, so thank you very much, first of all, for the invitation. I'm really glad to be here and to be able to talk about this, uh, which, as you say, has become some sort of a buzzword that many claim doesn't have any meaning anymore. And I believe it's really important because it's a term and and it's not just that the term tries to, you know, catch what happened in a particular moment in history uh, uh, more or less from the 1970s, 1980s onwards. But of course, the history goes a bit back because the thoughts and the, and the work by, by those that were behind this, this, this project uh, started much earlier. Uh, but I think it's important because it has shaped um, the, the economic and, and political uh, um, history of, of the world since then. And particularly in these two regions, Latin America and Eastern Europe, and even though today we often hear that you know neoliberalism is dead, and 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 we have a different type of you know uh, economic policy um, proposals, I think uh, we really need to understand what neoliberalism actually was, and that it's pretty much alive today and and, and in a very good shape, uh, and changing um, changing over time. Um, what is neoliberalism? I think that's, that's really important. Often people equalize neoliberalism with some sort of market-oriented policies. Uh, so liberalization, privatization, deregulation, and all of this. Um, and it's partly that, you know, the, the, the part of this is this, this set of policies um, that were supposed to improve uh, the, 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 um, the economy, to bring countries in these developing regions like Latin America and Eastern Europe to, uh, to de- be developed. Um, and, and it entailed a certain promise, you know, to living 
behind uh, the state, leaving behind uh, corruption, leaving behind poverty, you know. Uh, and and part, it's partly that. But neoliberalism is also a political project. And as you, you were saying, uh, Veronica, it's, it's a project uh, of thinking how to shape society, how to shape the polity, let's say the political order in a certain way. Right, so it's just not not just more markets or less markets, more state, less state, uh, because then you can say, of course, if you increase state intervention, then we don't have neoliberalism anymore. If you increase the welfare state, we don't have neoliberalism anymore, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And that's not the case because it's a more complex project, and the project is intended to shield uh, the decisions of individuals, but actually more companies, enterprises, uh, to shield those decisions from the power of majorities. This is a very old project that was uh, alive in conservative elites, you know, that were fearful even in the 19th century, that were fearful of the power that democracies would uh, give to, to the majority of people that were deprived from, from property, you know, from uh, workers, uh, let's say, um, were fearful from them and, 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 and feared that democracy would actually imply some sort of um, um, uh, forced redistribution from the rich, from the property owners to the working class. You know, so this project started actually as that. How can we build, shape a society, you know, a political and economic order in which you know the workers and the majorities cannot uh, deprive the rich from the means of production, from the property, and this is at the core of the neoliberal project. That's why it's not just about more market and more liberalizing policies that has some role, but also there's an important part uh, in every neoliberal project and even in the thinking about how to shape democracy, the institutions of democracy, so that different parts of the system wouldn't uh, actually impair and, and, and go against this basic uh, premise that property owners are shielded from the power of the majorities. Yes, uh, in your book, you actually are very nicely showing how the neoliberalism is, as you said now, kept uh, still alive and how it was actually introduced in, in the both contexts of Latin America or the countries of Latin America and, and Eastern Europe you have chosen. So you are actually showing there very nicely, I think, uh, several mechanisms how this neoliberal resilience is working. Could you tell us more now about these, these basic mechanisms which your research is showing? Right. Uh, thanks for the question. Um, first of all, I don't think these are the only mechanisms. There, there can be more mechanisms, but these are the, the, the basic ones that I found. And, and I think they are quite uh, important for understanding how neoliberalism uh, is still alive today. Uh, the basic premise is that neoliberalism, as we saw in Eastern Europe and Latin America, wrecks society. It produces... Um, um, with liberalization and deregulation, people lose their jobs. There are more financial crises and economic crises. Um, wait, uh, people are subject to the vagaries of markets, ups and downs. And so eventually, and we saw this as well, uh, people will start protesting against it and try to implement different policies to shield them from precisely this type of policies uh, and this type of, 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 of processes, right? So what I saw is that those countries that stayed longer and un even until today with, with the neoliberal project, uh, so those that show more resilient neoliberal trajectories, they did so through basically three mechanisms. One of them is related to the business class. So historically, when you see different types of capitalism, if you want, post-war capitalism was supported by a specific set of uh, business owners, right? It was more the industrialists that needed protection from world trade. Uh, in the case of Latin America, for example, we had import substituting industrialization. 
And these industrialists, domestic industrialists, were often in favor or actually supporting different types of capitalism, less liberal, more protectionist, more oriented towards uh, protecting the working class, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right? So there were different types of interests within the capitalist class. So the first set of mechanisms that I that I uh, explore uh, that I call support creation has to deal with how to create a unified business class in support for neoliberalism. So basically to bring together the business class that is often uh, divided into lines, industry versus finance or agriculture versus industry or different types of industry. So bring them together. They did this in, in practice. There are different ways of doing this through the regulation and creating new market niches, but they did this mostly through privatization, privatizing state companies and bringing them into the hands of business owners that uh, uh, you know these regimes knew that they were going to defend neoliberalism uh, in the future. You know this they created in, in different ways. They privatized to people that they knew that they were related to finance, for example, and sectors that usually support liberalization and deregulation in these policies. So one mechanism clearly is to unify the business class. So there wouldn't be an alternative sort of business sector supporting a more protectionist and more welfare related type of capitalism like the one we saw in the post-war era and the one that many uh, governments were trying to produce in the in the aftermath of the 1990s for example so that is, that's one mechanism the second has to do with i call blocking opposition so democracy what creates is spaces for the uh, manifestation of different political views right and you know if people want to introduce different policies and shield themselves from from uh, the effects of neoliberalism what they do is to vote for those parties that promise that they will uh, um, that they will enact different policies you know uh, more welfare uh, reduce the regulation re-regulate um, etc and what happened is that people that introduced uh, neoliberalism in these regions what they try to do is actually to engineer democratic institutions, uh, including party systems, electoral rules, etc., so that they would, on the one hand, boost the support or the representation of the right, and, and, and under, in the understanding that the right usually was more supportive of neoliberalism, and reduce the representation of the left. Uh, often, as I was saying, uh, introducing, for example, uh, non-majoritarian institutions to block what was happening in Congress or directly reducing the capacity or the chances of certain left parties to, to get into Congress or get elected. And the third one, it was sort of, sort of a, a safeguard, ultimate safeguard. You know, even in the event that the left could get into power, even in the event that there could be a business sector supporting that project, then they established a series of barriers for changing key policies, uh, even in the constitution. Yeah? Uh, for example, monetary policies, fiscal uh, policies. And they basically defined those policies, what they had to be in the constitution, so that nobody could change them, even if they were in, in, in power. So those three mechanisms, what they do is to reduce the capacity to represent alternative political projects, political economic projects, and increase the chances that neoliberalism survives in time. Okay. Nevertheless, many opponents of neoliberalism claim that neoliberalism, that free market is equals freedom. What you say is that neoliberalism is in principle undemocratic and limiting the scope of a democratic exchange of views. Do you tell us more about this, basing on the examples you uh, evoke in your book? How did neoliberal resilience and the quality of democracy were intertwined in uh, the countries you studied? How did neoliberalism, in other words, spoil the Southern American democracies? Yeah, that's a, that's an interesting question. Uh, I think I, I I agree with what you say. It's and in, in, in I would in principle agree that neoliberalism is some kind of freedom. 
I would say it, you, you have to ask yourself, is freedom for whom and freedom for what? <laughs> so I, 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 I concur that it's more freedom for property owners, right? And from the beginning, this was the type of freedom that they were trying to shield and that they were trying to protect, right? So nobody, as I was saying uh, before, uh, particularly collective actors or majorities would uh, impair the sovereign uh, liberties, decisions of individual companies, you know, uh, making them pay higher wages or respect labor legislation or environmental le legislation or whatever, right? Uh, so this freedom, the idea is to precisely to shield this freedom. But by doing that, you often, not necessarily, but often go against other freedoms, political freedoms, or even, uh, you know, democracy in itself. Um, as I was saying, you know, one thing is, you know, the, the, the neoliberal policies, and the other thing is all those mechanisms that allow these policies, this regime, this, this, this set of ideas of how to shape society, you know, those mechanisms that allow this to stay over time. Um, and I think this latter part is what is essentially undemocratic. Um, I, even if you, if, you, if you see, as I was saying, in, in the writings of, of the people that were part of this project, and they were thinking of, you know, when, when in, in the post-war era, uh, when Keynesianism and, and democracy, even in, in, uh, not just in society, but also in, in companies, uh, uh, labor unions, collective bargaining, and all of this, uh, they were thinking, you know, how to reduce democracy so that it wouldn't give all the power to, to, to people, to the working class. This was one essential idea of them. Uh, and so, and, and there were many writings uh, even saying this and, and, and conceptualizing this very explicitly. We need to reduce the scope of democracy. There's even a phrase by Hayek that is quite telling. He's saying, you know, there are several issues, you know, among which the number of people and the number of issues in which greater democratization is not always a good idea, right? This is a specific quote in a, in a book by Hayek. Um, and what they mean is precisely this, you know, too much democracy ends up impairing the freedom of companies of, of doing what they, they want. So an essential part of this project was precisely to be undemocratic of, or of limiting democracy. The idea of a limited democracy, uh, which in a way they, they get away with saying that they're protecting minorities from uh, eventually from the power of majorities, which sounds good. But which minorities are that and which liberties are they protecting? It's the property owning majority, uh, minorities, sorry, and their economic freedoms mostly. Yes, uh, I would still, because uh, we in the Central and Eastern Europe, we are every day basically, uh, we, we, we are reflecting or we are seeing that it's very difficult in these societies to create any alternative, any alternative development project, which would be uh, not neoliberal or which would be even even clearly anti-neoliberal. Uh, of course, as uh, your book is showing, there are varieties of neoliberalism. There is no pure neoliberalism in each country. You are showing it in Poland and Estonia, but if you take Czech Republic, which is my homeland country and so on, you see the different var varieties. But still, it's very difficult to uh, really put in the political mainstream the alternative visions to create the coalition or social block which would be uh, able to put in the mainstream uh, this uh, this clear and serious alternative could you tell us probably what are the these why it's so what are the the key mechanism of key modus operandi uh, of, of neoliberalism that it is really so believed that the, you know this Thatcherian, uh, um, Thatcherian slogan. There is no alternative. There is no alternative. It really seems uh, to many people in Central Eastern Europe that there is no alternative to neoliberalism. So, why, why it's not alternative? Why it seems there is no alternative? 
Yeah, I, I think that these mechanisms that I was talking about, the result of this is, is actually to reduce the, the, the possibility that those alternatives are um, expressed in, in public debate, right? So just to, to give you an example for, for, from, from my own country, Chile, which is one of the cases that I study, uh, the, the fact that you don't have alternative business sectors, for example, uh, wanting to change existing policies, wanting to change existing regime, funding uh, different parties, funding uh, think tanks and, and, and funding uh, studies you know, to support different ideas, if you don't have that, you only have a one side, you know, support through all these means, right? We have the, 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 that business class was actually uh, funding think tanks that produce uh, studies that supported all of the policies that uh, were implemented, right? And th that said that that's the way to go. Um, they were funding the parties and those um, candidates that were supporting those, those ideas. Right. Um, and so in the end, when it comes to moments in which people are dissatisfied, they go to the polls to vote. What they do, what, what happens is that they don't have alternatives to, to, to vote for different, for different uh, projects. Right. You may have different parties, different candidates, but since we have only one way of seeing things and since we have only one set of funders, right, for those parties, then the political space is really reduced, right? Uh, and this creates, if you, if you, you know, what, what has hap what happened in Chile for a long time is that actually the, the political space seemed frozen, right? You had a left, you had a right, but actually their proposals were not that different from each other, right? So they were just giving power to, the, to, the, to each other uh, sometimes more the left, sometimes more the right. Uh, but actually, people went to vote one and one, uh, one time, a second time, another time, and you know there weren't many changes. And you could see that even in the political system, it was very difficult to think about uh, different ways of doing things. Um, I think countries are, even though we we have globalization and these things, countries look at themselves a lot. And, and it is difficult to even to, to, to connect with alternative experiences elsewhere, right? So the political system itself, it's sort of uh, filtering, you know, what's happening in the world. And, you know, through all these means that I have just said, uh, what is presented to the public debate is, you know, uh, what are the alternatives that we have now are you know, continuing on, on this path. So I think this uh, situation is what generates lots of frustration as well. And in those countries, for example, as in Poland, where neoliberalism was more limited, you know, and some of these mechanisms, like the one related to, to politics, were a bit more open, what happened is that you have um, a, a new groups, new parties, you know, presenting alternatives or seeming alternatives, uh, but you don't control that anymore. Some of those alternatives may even go against the very democratic system. So it ends up creating many ills, not just for the countries that remain very neoliberal and that have their political systems very much frozen, but also for those that create alternatives outside those that that frozen uh, political system you know and where you don't control anymore what happens outside that political system and you have all sorts of mavericks and 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 and, and new political groups that present people with alternatives right that may be even against democracy or even against the people but since they what they really want is alternatives they they haven't had alternatives they will go for them and, and this creates all sorts of new problems, as we are seeing in some parts of Eastern Europe. 
Chile was described, is often described as a laboratory of neoliberalism. And you said, you have just said how frozen your political system was. And yet in 2019, it was Chile who suddenly became the epicenter of neoliberal contestation. And all the world was watching mass demonstration in Santiago and other cities. And people saying explicitly, we don't want this kind of system. We want have, we want a systemic change and we are, we stand up against neoliberalism. Could you tell us more how, which dynamic brought Chile to this moment? Why it was why at that point Chilean society stood up to neoliberalism, and uh, to what extent is this? Could this experience be repeated in other places you studied, including Eastern Europe? Yeah, well, this is very interesting, and it has many angles to it. Of course, it's a complex story. But if you if you follow a little bit what I'm just saying, um, two things happened in Chile. For a long time, this frozen political system that seemed to work, it was sort of a model democracy in which people would go to vote, uh, civil liberties were, were respected, there was seeming uh, political competition, but actually no meaningful alternatives. What happened is that for a long time, people chose the exit from, from that situation. So what they what happened is that they withdrew to the private realm. They wouldn't go to vote. So uh, voting rates were going down and down uh, for a long, long time. Uh, uh, participation in, in, in elections was less than 50%, uh, even now, uh, less than 50%. Uh, respect for the political system was the worst in the whole Americas, even being the country with the, the, the best um, official figures in terms of how good the political system is, how stable it is, how well are, how good are institutions and how well they're functioning. Actually, people were the most, uh, were the ones who most disliked political institutions and, and the way democracy was functioning in whole Latin America. You see, so it, this really created this antagonism and this detachment between the people and the political system. At some point, politicians realized this and they start undoing some of, the, uh, of those mechanisms, try to bring new political alternatives so that they would represent all this uh, disenchantment sentiment. And this created sort of the voice um, um, a, a response from the from the people. They started voting those 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 new alternatives, but though since that wasn't enough because people had accumulated so many um, um, frustrations in time, uh, they went to the streets, um, and this erupted as we saw as we saw as in, and it's called the um, uh, social outburst of, of 2019 with many different uh, uh, demands, uh, very, uh, um, some of them were connected, some of them less connected, but all of them wanting changes, um, changes to public, specific public policies, an overall feeling that politicians were not, were not caring for society, uh, an, an overall feeling that, you know, uh, there was a lot of inequalities that were entrenched and there wasn't any possibility to change that. Um, but as you see, the constitution became uh, sort of a focal point, uh, partly because of the reasons that I, uh, that I was just saying, that many of the things that uh, of the project of the neoliberalism was entrenched in the constitution. So that was seen as we changed the constitution and we can actually have alternatives. Uh, but that was a different and very complex process. Uh, but what shows, you know, the result of that and we can talk a bit, a, a bit more about that if you want, uh, is that these mechanisms are quite entrenched. Business community, for example, fought very hardly to maintain their privileges. And uh, I think the population um, arrived in a, to a state of such distrust with political institutions after all this time of having a frozen political system that you know, telling them you will have a new constitution written by a certain group of elected people, they started saying, well, we have a new Congress now, sort of writing the new constitution. We don't like this. It's not a, you know, institutions, political institutions 
uh, are, are not trusted. So all of these years, what have created is a huge gap between what can be done at the political level and what people actually want and, and, and how to satisfy that. And, and we haven't really come together to, to think about how to, uh, how to close that gap. Okay, then I would like to ask you what have we learned from this Chile experiment, exper Chile experience, and what is the future of the Chile experience? If neoliberalism inflicted such huge losses on people's conscience and of people's trust towards institutions, even if the institutions are not the same as before 2019, then what is the way forward? And is it possible to fight this legacy of neoliberalism? Uh, I think it's really difficult. Um, I think it's a very um, complex situation in which you have, I mean, in which you need a new institutions, new constitution that allow a, a new political game, let's say, uh, in many ways. But people are don't trust that. I think, you know, lessons that you may have is That's one, one it's really thing. difficult to try to freeze uh both the political system and the economic model uh in one way or the other and this is is, is important to understand both for the side of of those who are in favor of neoliberalism but also those who are against neoliberalism uh a, a main point in a main uh you know it's it's a strength but also a drawback in a way of democracy but but we should see it as a strength is that it creates competition for different alternatives. And I think these alternatives should be up for grabs and, and should be allowed to manifest themselves in, in a political system. If you don't have that, then you come to a situation in which you have a frozen uh, political system, political order that creates this type of uh, representation gaps, as I was saying. At the same time, and this is the, the problem with democracy, you need to make sure that those representation alternatives you know, those alternatives don't go to the extremes that want to erode the very basis of democracy. And this is what we're seeing in, in certain parts of Eastern Europe, for example, and also now in certain parts of Latin America with the rise of the radical right that is not very fond of democracy from the start. So uh, I think it's both a challenge and, and, um, and, 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 and uh, you know, and I, we need to be very humble about what we can have and in a democratic system. And we need to understand also that as, as people that may be against this, this neoliberal radicalness and, 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 and how this froze uh, the alternatives, we need to be uh, very careful about allowing this political game to have, um, in the end, what democracy is about, you know, uh, changing governments, uh, allowing different options to manifest themselves uh, and try not to freeze the capacity of, of people to feel represented by different alternatives. I think uh, we are coming to the conclusion of this interview uh, and I think uh, everybody is able to find the book and read the book itself. The book is, of course, uh, very detailed in uh, explaining uh, what is neoliberalism, what is neoliberal silence, what is the contestation of neoliberalism, what are the three mechanisms uh, which are behind and uh, is actually researching all these um, all these policy um, policy making stories, all the what is behind. I, I think it is very. Uh, informative and uh, very very important for everybody uh, who is in Central East Europe and who is in Latin America to have this comparison. As Aldo said, we often are self-involved if uh, with our own issues and own national policies and politics, but we actually share with Latin America, I think, much more than we are realizing and admitting. So thank you uh, for Aldo Madariega that he came to our uh, talk and he was sharing with us his uh, knowledge and his ideas. And I will remind everybody that cross-border talks are on several different um, platforms. Uh, there is the video in YouTube form, there is SoundCloud, there is Spotify. You can see us, you can listen to us. 
you can uh, also see uh, subtitles on YouTube in several different national languages according to situation. And of course, we are also on social uh, networks, social media, and uh, we are also having uh, own page uh, on which you can see the newest uh, articles about the all issues around the world. So thank you very much for your time, Aldo, and thank you everybody who was with us today. Have a nice day or evening, whatever time it is. Thank you.